Good morning. Welcome to the Independent Baptist Church of Falkirk morning service, April 7th, 2024. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. We can stand in fe uh, fellowship together, that we can study your word, that we can think of your person. We pray, Father, you might just bless and encourage our hearts. We pray for those that are away this morning, keep them safe. Those that are traveling, Father, help them on their way. Those, Father, that are ill, we pray that you would uh, strengthen their bodies and raise them up again. Those that have made poor choices, Father, you'd help them to see the error and that they would turn back toward thee. We pray, Father, for those that are working, that you would encourage and help them. And then, Father, we pray that you would just be with the government this morning, help them to do that which is right before thee. We thank, Father, of those that are uh, away for various other reasons that you might just bless. Be with us now as we fellowship together that Jesus might be exalted for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Psalm 48, verses 8 to 14. Psalm 48, verses 8 to 14. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God. Verse 8. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts. In the city of our God, God will establish it forever. See God. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. According to thy name, O God, so is the, thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughter of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. Walk about Zion and go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark ye well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that ye may tell it in the generation following. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our God even unto death. I'm sorry, he will be our guide even unto death. May the Lord ask blessing to the reading of the word. Thank you, may be seated. Church notices. Be praying for one another. Anything else? Lessons in Luke. Message title, The Law of Forgiveness. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. But before we go there, let's look at four things upon which to brood. Number one, do you forget when you forgive? A lot of people don't. Do you assess whether or not a person is sincere when they apologize? Most people do. Is there a limit to the number of times you will allow a person to offend you? For most people there are, there is. And then the most important question of the morning, did you recover your lost hour by sleeping longer or going to bed early? Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should, be a, that, that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass thee against, against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again and say unto thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. The apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand what's going on here. Help us see the importance, Father, of this idea of forgiveness, since it is the foundation 
and basis for our salvation. That you having paid the penalty of sin in the person of Christ are then and only then able to forgive us of that sin. Not because you're put in a way not to do anything about it, but because it has been paid for in the person of Christ. And we pray that you might just guide our thoughts in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the interesting thing is, the scriptures teach us that as we have been forgiven of God, we should forgive others. And it's very interesting to note that when God forgives, He puts our sin behind His back so He can't see it. He puts it in the deepest sea so that it will never come up again. He puts it as far as the east is from the west so that no one will ever, ever bring it back. It's amazing. But we don't do that. We are otherwise. The simple truth. It's very hard for us to recognize that this is a simple truth. Often people think they can go along through life and never have any troubles, never have any offenses show up. And when they do, they are amazed and just mortified that anyone could ever do anything like this. And it always happens. But Jesus put it this way. Then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come. And you thought you'd go through life and no one would ever say anything or do anything to you or to offend you. But notice what he says. But woe unto him through whom they come. Hmm. It were better for him. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea and that he should offend one of these little ones. So the interesting thing is, as we consider this verse, is the direction it seems to take. We assume he's just going to warn us that there will be offenses, but it immediately turns about to us being the offender. So after dealing with the stories of the unjust steward and the rich man Lazarus, which offended everybody that listened to them in both cases, Jesus moves on what is actually normal, the next subject, offenses. Those things that cause difficulty for others. But again, as I mentioned, there's a twist to it. It's guaranteed that it would be some. And guess what? He says, you don't want to be the one by whom they come. We often don't consider much of it. We have a tendency to tolerate our own errors. We make comments like, that's just the way I am. Or in the modern vernacular, that's the way I roll. The whole thing comes down to it, we often fail to consider the fact that some of the things we do can be offensive. But then again, we've got some other problems here because this is not talking just about those type of offenses. This is the idea of, it's not the idea of hurting feelings or of violating opinions. So we have that, that's, that's part of it, but it's not entirely about that. What he's actually talking about and emphasizing more is a very simple truth that sometimes what we do causes others to be offended in a way we're not expecting. And that's this way. This is the purpose, purposeful act of encouraging others or causing others to sin. Now, I would never do a thing like that is often heard on the lips of many. Talk about somebody like Hitler or uh, uh, Mussolini or Saddam Hussein or Joseph Stalin or some other person of that nature. And we would say, I would never do that. Well, you know what the difference is between you and them? Between me and them? between us and them, for often just opportunity and circumstance where we find ourselves. I mean, you got to think about it. Hitler, for example, was born to a poor Jewish woman, lived in a ghetto in Austria. Single mom who worked quite a number of hours a day just to provide for them. He grew up in poverty. 
he then met a few people that he agreed with in a lot of different ways. The next thing you know, they have created the Third Reich. The amazing thing is he's decided that he hates Jews being part Jewish. That's the amazing part. But then sets about to murder every one of them he can find. What's the difference? Different ones grew up in different ways, in opulence and poverty, but every one of them made mistakes. Our lives are opportunity. Things that we find ourselves in. The places we find ourselves going. This here is talking about the opportunities that we have in our lives to do those things that cause others to sin. Now sometimes we don't think of it. We come out with a statement about something and we make somebody, we offend somebody and our very action causes an offense but it also sometimes causes them to make a choice. People say stuff like, well, you know, you got to be like them to win them. No. You have to be like God to win them. You can go into a pub and sit down and talk to somebody about Jesus. Oh, you can do that. And you can have a glass of orange juice while you do it. But some other person goes into that pub while you're in there talking about Jesus. They're far enough away that they can't hear you, so they don't know you're talking about Jesus. They see your friend order a drink, you get a drink. How do they know it's not? What do they call that? A screwdriver's vodka and orange? How do they know that's not what you got? So they're sitting there and they've been debating whether or not they should drink, even though the Bible says you shouldn't. You know what? There are some Christian teachers that say that that's, that's not what the Bible says. Yes, it is. The Bible never condones public drunkenness and only gives two reasons to serve drink to anyone. One, you're dying of a fatal illness. Or two, you're condemned to death. In both cases, the person you're giving the booze to is having a hard time handling their circumstance. Now, somebody said, well, you know, the Bible allows for people to have, have drink. Yes, it does. But it never condones public drunkenness. He said, well, you're saying it doesn't allow it. It doesn't, actually. What Paul says, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Guess what? <coughs> the water was not purified. It wasn't clean. He couldn't go to the Roman tap, draw out a glass of water, and be certain he wasn't going to get parasites. So you would put a little alcohol in there to kill him. That's what he's talking about. But the whole thing comes down to there's all kinds of little things that people do that say that are offensive in different ways that encourage or cause others to sin. And we often don't pay much attention to what we're doing. We don't consider that sometimes a harsh response to somebody for an accident might cause them to turn away from the Lord and find themselves in eternity in the lake of fire because we were harsh. So he's talking more about that. That's why we have, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they may come. They're certainly going to be there, but we don't want to be the person that does it. We want to live our lives by God's grace and mercy in a way that always draws people to the Lord. So the simple truth is this. You're going to make mistakes. And there are going to be people that are going to make mistakes around you. But the way you deal with them is more important than the fact that they're there because they're always going to be there. The thing is, it requires the proper response. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if you repent, forgive him. And he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again uh, to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, the proper response to offenses is forgiveness. They're going to come. 
But notice what he says. Take heed to yourself. The first and most important thing that we need to do is notice that this is the person being spoken to. In other words, when he started, he's talking to the apostles. He said, you take heed to yourself. Now this, these are the guys that eventually become the leadership. But at the time he says it, yeah, they're chosen as leadership, and yeah, they're the, the principal disciples, but they're not the ultimate leadership. They're not the, the pastors of the churches yet. And Jesus says to them, as he would say to all of his disciples that were around him, take heed to yourself. Listen to what you're saying. Listen to how you're dealing with things. Notice what's going on in your life. But then he turns it to another direction. If thy brother trespass against thee. Hmm. So the person being offended is you. Hmm. Why would he go that route? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that yes, we sometimes respond improperly, even though we might think we are doing okay. But he says, You pay attention to what you're doing. And if the person trespasses against you, there's a way to do it. If you, uh, you rebuke him. And if he repents, you forgive him. So, the person being spoken to is the person who's got to deal with this stuff. The first thing a person must do when offended is deal with it. How do most people want to deal with offenses? They want to ignore them. They want to let them slide. They want to just get by without any friction. Most people would rather not have to have a contentious life. But notice he says, rebuke him. Deal with it. Don't let it go. Do it immediately. The offense shows up. This is just, just, just a minute. Excuse me. That, that, that's wrong. But there's an important thing about this. The side note. Rebuking is not about telling somebody off in anger or in a rage. Somebody comes along and says something stupid. We don't come up with you stupid idiot. Is there anything else? You, you're totally ignorant. I, there are a lot of times I'd love to say something like that. I'd love to be able to get a hold of some of these people that come up with some of the stupid stuff they say. Say, excuse me, but is there anything else you're totally ignorant in? Maybe we could list the subjects and avoid those. Oh, incidentally, just in case you don't haven't heard about it. Richard Dawkins is now lamenting the demise of Christianity. <laughs> Not because he's a Christian, but because he realizes that Western society is built upon the morals of Christian teaching. Just thought you'd like to know about that. Because Dawkins is one of the guys I like to say, excuse me, but you're really stupid. And a lot of times it shows when you come up with something like evolution, because then we would really have an argument, wouldn't we? Because he doesn't think he's an heir. So, rebuking doesn't mean telling somebody off. In fact, the purpose of, of rebuking is correction and restoration. You don't rebuke somebody for the sake of putting them down. You rebuke them for the sake of correcting their error and encouraging them further. Notice, encouraging them further so that they grow from that experience so that they move forward so that they become better because they were corrected and are now able to move forward in correction that's what it's about if thy brother trespass against thee rebuke him show him where he's wrong and encourage him to do right 
but all too often we want to just show them the wrong. We had somebody, we had children at um, Troon. As they got older into teen years, they became, oh, let's put it this way, they became more streetwise and worldly. They would go through the week uh, walking about the city, causing disruption, drinking their cider, thinking they were cool, being stupid. And of course, as we had opportunity to talk to them, we corrected them. Had three or four of the boys show up at my house one day. I was watering the lawn. I was sitting on my lawn chair. Nice sunny day. Lawn was beautiful green. I've got the hose out and water them on and they come over and they're talking with me. And they're talking about the, some of the stuff they do. And I said, excuse me, but don't you think that's kind of stupid? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, you're talking about going over and causing trouble for an older person, making their life miserable. I said, one day you're going to be old. And I said, guess what? What goes around comes around, usually does. You're going to be the old guy sitting in the chair getting abused by teenagers. And it's going to be worse because you know what you're doing. Well, you know, they wouldn't listen. But we had another worker with us. What they wanted to do was just cut them off, kick them out, leave them in the gutter. No. God never wants that of us. He never wants that as the way to correct. Another side note. The offended does not have the luxury of judging the sincerity of the apology. Notice what he says. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and is seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Here's a question for you. If somebody's going to do something that offends you and you call them out on it and he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. And then 10 minutes later, he does it again. And so you call him out again and he says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are you going to believe him? That's usually all it takes is one time that he fails to, to do what he says and we no longer believe that he's honest. But notice what he says. Seven times in a day, and seven times he says, forgive me. Look at the response. Thou shalt forgive him. Now notice, this is why it's called the law of forgiveness. It is not an option for the Christian. It is not an option for the Christian to assess the, the, the sincerity of the apology. It is not an option of the Christian to Keep a record. Every apology is to be accepted as offered. Forgiveness is to be real. Honestly. Forgiven. Letting it now go from, from this point on. It's over. No archiving files for later reference. Had this. We had, I had a circumstance where I can't remember what it was I did. I, I just did something and the person was offended and I apologized and about three weeks later was in another circumstance where I did the same thing and as soon as I'd done it I realized that person's going to be offended and I said oh I'm really sorry and they went yeah well three weeks ago you did it and I said oh I, I know that's why I'm apologizing I didn't wait for you to say something I recognize I made a mistake and, and so I, I'm, I'm apologizing yeah well I don't buy it you obviously made the last apology. Why should I accept this one? Well, here's why. You got no choice. You have to accept every apology as valid and real. Why? Because it may be, but it's not yours to judge. Then, of course, no matter how many times it happens. In another passage of scripture, there's how many times, how many times does this have to happen? It's like 49. Uh, seven times seven. 490 times. And the whole thing comes down to as, as, we, as we consider this, we know this is going to take place. 
And you know what's going on? He's wanting us to have our response be biblical, be godly. Because you know what happens with us? We meet the Lord Jesus as our Savior and He saves us. We then go about our daily lives living for ourselves and apologizing and God forgives us. And God forgives us. And God forgives us. And God forgives us. And God doesn't demand an apology that is sincere. And I'll, I'll take it to, to your grave with you. He says, I will take your sin and put it behind my back as far as the east is from the west. As far as the deepest sea. It's gone. Why? Because it's paid for. And then the unexpected connection. Because we don't often make the connection. We look at these experiences as though they're, well, just at life, you know, it's just the way things work out and people are people and all that kind of thing. But this is not, he's not talking about just that kind of thought. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. You see, because this is more than just a life circumstance. The apostles make an interesting connection here between forgiveness and faith. Which we often don't make. We often miss it because we're so bent on the fact the guy's going to do it again that we're trying to figure out how we can keep this stored up so we know what's going on. I remember hearing somebody say, well, for the last 17 times that this has happened, you've done this. So they were keeping that count. But that's not the way faith works. Mainly, that it is not an emotional, but spiritual, an act of obedience. Oh, wait a minute. An act of obedience. You remember? Let me back up and look at that verse again. Remember? He says, and turn again to the saying, I repent. Thou shalt forgive him. It was a command. Somebody says, I'm sorry I made a mistake. The Christian's response has got to be, I forgive you. We had a circumstance where I'd done something wrong. I took a position without thinking it through and took it the wrong way. Not, I didn't take the wrong position. I went about it the wrong way. I got called out on it. I had to go take care of it. As a result, I was sitting in a room with about 12 or 8 or 9 people. The person that was offended was across from me. His goal was to get me out of the ministry. He didn't care if, he, if I apologized. He just wanted to ruin my life. I had to prove why I had done what I'd done. I had a folder, an inch thick, of letters and articles that condemned what he had done and the reason I, I'd done what I'd done. As I started through it, he wouldn't let it go. He would kept arguing with me, trying to, to show that the article was wrong. One of them was a, a, a article in a news magazine. I had letters that he'd written about my family that were vicious letters. Finally, I closed my folder. I'd only gotten through one or two things. And I said, given the fact that I did not do this properly, I'm sorry. I make no excuse for myself. I didn't do it right. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? He would. Finally, one of the other people who were moderating the thing had to step in and say, if John didn't come here today and deal with us this way, would we be here? And he said, yes. And he says, so are you going to accept his apology or not? And he went, no. And the guy said, well, I guess we're done. We don't have that option. You can't say no. We have to forgive, whether we like it or not. 
But we also have to understand what's going on. And our forgiveness has got to be real. Because our forgiveness from God is real. Side note, forgiveness does not mean that the offender is let off the hook for damages caused. Some do, someone does something that causes damage. That damage it does actually need to be repaired. It needs to be taken care of because there's something very interesting about the way things work in, in this universe. God put our sin on Christ. The reason God can forgive us of our sins because Jesus paid our debt. Now a lot of times what we do is we consider, well, if Jesus paid our debt, then I'm free from having paid the debt. So I don't have to worry about it. But Jesus did. He paid our debt. The debt had been paid. Why can God let us off free from the penalty of sin? Because Jesus paid the debt. But in the offenses between believers or between people, the debt's not paid. There's no debt there as far as God's concerned. We have a, a, an offense between two people. That needs to be dealt with properly. And guess what? One of the evidences of a true apology is a willingness to pay the price. But we don't have to look for it. We just have to forgive. And we can expect, and it's proper and right, to expect a payment, a correction, and it ought to be done. Because remember, we're dealing with both sides. You don't want to be the guy offending, but if you are, here's how we deal with it. Forgiveness restores the sinner to fellowship. That's what it's all about. Forgiveness restores. Gives him access to the throne of God. When we have our sins forgiven, we get a direct access to God's throne. Jesus says, Whatsoever you ask in my name, I will give it to you. Why? Because you've got access. Come boldly before the throne of grace, Paul says. And then finally, forgiveness blesses the, 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 the erring pe person with eternity with God, not eternity in the lake of fire. That's what God wants us to have, and that's what he wants us to give to others, an understanding that God loves them, and our forgiveness willfully, deliberately, purposely, purposely given helps toward that end. It moves them toward understanding that God loves them. Because that's why we forgive the offender. Because God forgives them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for all your mercy to us, Father, and the way you work in our lives. We thank you for the fact that Jesus, having paid the penalty for sin, you can then forgive us our sin and to give us all the blessings and benefits of faithfulness. We thank you, Father, that we have you as the great example so that we might live our lives by that example. In Jesus' name, amen.